Thanks for tuning in to Men for the Win, a podcast hosted by David Kufis and Dan Thompson, two avid fans who appreciate well-played baseball, especially when it's done by the Twins. Men for the Win is sponsored by The Grand Group with Edina Realty. Are you looking to purchase a new home in the Twin Cities area? Or perhaps you're trying to sell your current home? Whether you're upsizing or downsizing, The Grand Group with Edina Realty will meet all of your housing needs. Contact The Grand Group by emailing the Grand G-R-A-N, group at edinarealty.com or call them by phone at 612-817-8751. The Grand Group with Edina Realty, three-time Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine Super Agent Award winners. On this episode, David and Dan recap the Twins' two-game series against the Milwaukee Brewers. Thanks for listening. Enjoy. Thanks for tuning in to Men for the Win. My name is David Kupis. With me, as always, is Dan Thompson. The Twins split a quick two-game series against the Milwaukee Brewers. And if there's one thing, Dan, that brings fans to Target Field, it's the border battle when both teams are good. Can you believe it, Dan? 37,000 on Tuesday night and 38,000 on Wednesday afternoon. Those are such fun experiences to go to full ballparks, especially, gosh, it's when, you, when you're playing a rival like this. You, do you remember when these were weekend series like, I just loved yeah. when they were weekend series. I went to one of these games in Milwaukee one year. Bramer was talking about how some people could go, well, you t- you come in Tuesday, you just have one hotel night, you go to the Wednesday game, and you go home if you're a Milwaukee fan. But there's something about having that three-game series. I just wish, I wish that was still the case. And uh, and did you watch game two on the YouTube? Oh, uh, man, yeah. David, it's <sighs> your favorite broadcasting production team right there. I can't believe it. I'm sure we'll get into that, Dan. One other note here, the Twins do have a four-and-a-half game lead in the Central. The White Sox take two of three from the guard. Guardians. And I got to be honest, Dan, the AL Central, they are doing their best to make sure these twins stay in first place. I know the YouTube people were saying, well, you know, the White Sox have so much talent. They have to turn it around. Well, at some point, like, aren't you who you are? Like we said that about the twins last year for a long time, right? Longer were than we should have. Under- <laughs> exactly. So- Longer than we should have. If we're like, you know, anytime that you're trying to hope to get in the same tens place with your losses as you are with the wins, you know that your team isn't very good. Well, hopefully the twins, they're 49 and 41. They can hopefully get to the 50 and maybe get to 10 more wins than losses here by the All-Star break. That'd be pretty great. That would be fantastic, Dan. With that, let's jump into the series recap. Series recap. Game one, Dan. Twins lose this one six to three. It is just riddled with rain delays. There's, just, I think there were three rain delays. They were lengthy. This game took seven hours longer than it should have, Dan Thompson. Well, technically, there was only an hour 43 of delays. The first two actually felt really quick. I, I remember even the first one, Rocco had to go out and actually kind of ask for it mid Geo Urshela at bat. And then it was funny because then the next one was also in the midst of a Geo Urshela at bat. Polanco was kind of the lone bright spot. Um, he did have that one home run. But other than that, the Twins just really can't muster much offense. With Polanco, I mentioned this a couple episodes ago. You tell me that guy didn't change his swing, especially from the left side of the plate. He is way more open, and you can tell he is swinging for the fences. And there's all this talk about Jim Cott getting his number retired, and he's going to Cooperstown this summer, which is great. I'm kind of wondering, is Polanco, are we going to count him among the great twins by the end of his career? I know we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. He hasn't been like an all-star every year. but A, l- he, a little ahead a of little, ourselves. <laughs> Well, what are you I'm just talking saying, about? he's been with the Twins for like eight or nine seasons now. And I just think, you know, he might be one of those career guys with the Twins. <sighs> I, Dan, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have the energy to get into this conversation about you talking about Jorge Polanco making the Hall of Fame. Let's just, let's keep talking about <laughs> game one. Winder struggles. It's his first game back from the IL. He goes five innings pitched, five earned runs, two walks, two strikeouts, and two home runs given up. And here's the thing. I think it had to be so difficult for him to be coming in and out of these games during these rain delays, trying to have to sit back down and then get back up and get warmed up. I think it's hard, and it's disappointing to see him get sent down, I think. I think I'd rather have him have a couple more starts than Archer, who seems to be in line for the start on Sunday. Thank goodness St. Paul is only a light rail ride away, David, that he can just, he doesn't have to move. Yeah, way better than the old Rochester jaunt, right? Yes. Um, Any other notes you've got on this one? Yeah, so the only other thing in game one, there were there were two things I wanted to mention. One, there was a good play by Gordon running very aggressively, running to second in the bottom of the fourth. So he hits a ball that's likely a single, but the throw from the outfield went to third base because there was a runner advancing to third, and he advanced to second on that. It was a close play at second, but at that point in the game, it was the good move. It was a good risk to take. Unlike a lot of those other losses, we talked about this last episode where the last 10 losses by 
by the Twins have been by two or one runs. I mean, this one didn't really feel... There was that one moment when Urshela comes up with the bases loaded uh, and the Twins are down four, but other than that, it just didn't feel like they were really that close to breaking through against the Brewers. Anytime you have the rain delays like that, it just throws the whole rhythm of the game off. So it, last it note here on game one, there's some cool celebrations for home runs in baseball, certainly. However, the Thanos Infinity Gauntlet that the Brewers use for the home run hits... That's pretty good. And they've had a lot of opportunities to do it this year. I think they're third in the majors in home runs. Yeah, it's a pretty cool celebration. But with that, Dan, here, let's move on to game two. I like your opening note here, David. Oh, YouTube announcers, how how I loathe thee, Dan Thompson. What did you think of the trophy, though? Because Miranda got one of those really cool YouTube game of the star of the game trophies at the end. Oh, man. You know, we, yeah, we can't we can't reuse that as the episode title. But my goodness, it's silly. It's just so silly. It's just because you happen to play a game on a particular network that you got an award. Like, it's not like there was anything more meaningful to this game. No, and it was funny, too, because of the voting, you know, because they they had to force people to vote on who was going to be that star of the game obviously it's Miranda he hits the game winning home run in the ninth inning but they also had Celestino on there as an option as if anybody was going to pick him it's like why do we even have to put this up to a poll it was clearly Miranda here in this game so my favorite quote from the from the YouTube duo just head of their class as far as announcers are concerned Celestino makes a great diving catch great catch great right here's a line that I wouldn't think that you would expect to hear out of Dan Gladden, Corey Provis, Dick Bramer's mouth. Of course, Celestino to the rescue. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> well, I don't I have no idea. Like it was some like expectation that of course Celestino is gonna put the team on his back. And, like I just have no idea. Of course, even if you said Celestino to the rescue, right? Like that's fine in and of itself. But to say of course, like like is he the guy on this team? Did I miss <laughs> did I miss that memo? He is the heroic backup to Byron Buxton. He allows Buxton to DH, and, and everybody doesn't have that collective gasp that we had last year when it was Nick Gordon being forced out into, into center field. So I guess in that way, uh, Celestino is to the rescue. Um, you know, he's hitting 274. He had a hit in this game that was an RBI, so he was useful in this game, certainly. Well, we definitely skipped ahead, and we buried the lead, Dan. <laughs> you got me so riled up about the YouTube announcers. If you didn't see the game, folks, the Twins do win this one 4-1. to one. Joe Ryan looks great on the mound goes five and a third innings pitched two hits one run is earned it's a solo shot two walks three strikeouts he looks pretty good season era at 2.99 the other note i wanted to say about celestino also celestino goes back on a ball that's hit to straightaway center and it ends up being the home run that joe ryan gave up here's the thing celestino played that as good as he could have it was perfect he, he took the best line he got a great leap at the ball buxton makes that catch like i know we say that but this time Celestino isn't faster than Buxton, and he's a little shorter than Buxton. I think the three inches that Celestino was short in catching that ball, Buxton gets there. Yeah, probably, I guess. Uh, it was one of those things where the Twins really should have won this game 10-2 to 2 or something like that. They had so many opportunities, wasted so many base runners and such, and it, it felt like the Brewers were, were just going to find a way to steal the game from the Twins. Anytime you go 2 for 11 with runners in scoring position, the only time that works, Dan, is when your opponent goes 0 for 8 in that same situation. And that's got to be a credit to the Twins pitching staff. Ryan pitched well, like you said. Fieldbar pitched well. Jax pitched well. Duran came in and got his first win, actually, as a major leaguer. So it was an encouraging outing, again, from a bullpen that's really struggled. And gosh, you know, Hayter just did not have it. I was really glad, actually, in some ways to see him come out because he's not been great for them the last couple games. And he pitched in game one. So he was. I was a little surprised they turned to him. Well, yeah, Williams had 17 pitches in the bottom of the eighth. And I thought 17 is probably pushing it. And if you have Hayter, I mean, you're not going to not use him right like even if he struggled as of late I mean he's still kind of the guy it was fun though to watch Jose Miranda get up there and he doesn't need to do much right he doesn't need a home run in that situation but to get the walk-off win on a home run had to be fantastic especially when it's off hater it's not just off some you know some no one known like he's going to remember that hit for a long time and we have to give credit to Tommy Watkins a couple innings earlier in the bottom of the seventh with one out, not sending Correa on Kepler's double, which when Kepler hit that ball into the corner, I thought, oh, Correa's going to score. There's no there's no trouble. But the fielder really got to it quickly. And, and I thought it was the right call. But it's funny because Tommy Watkins is like two thirds of the way down the third baseline when he's yeah. giving Correa the stop. So full disclosure, folks, I put this in the notes. I called them out for making the right call and not sending Correa, even though it didn't pan out. Right. Like I sure. think Correa would have been thrown out and they didn't score the run anyway, but it was still the right call. Well, we're going to talk more about these games, I think, uh, through our segments, but I think we should probably move forward. Catch them all, Kirby Puckett! 
Puckett's Picks winner. I knew you Love were. Love it. And, and the moment that Miranda <laughs> came up to the plate even, I thought, gosh dang it. Luis Arise is on deck, but I don't want it to get to Luis Arise. I want the Twins to win it here, but I was conflicted just a teeny tiny little bit because you had Miranda, and I think we were pretty much, t- I think you were actually behind at the time. Anyway, you won with Jose Miranda, eight points. The listeners had Correa, four points, and I had Arise, and they just had two. So you have extended your lead now in the season standings. You have 13. I have nine. The listeners have six. I still lead by 11 in the overall points scored, (laughs) but I am now behind by four in the win column. Yeah, I like that. I like that. And honestly, Miranda hitting the home run, it was just bound to happen because, folks, if there's one thing you can count on, it's when I pick a guy who I haven't picked much, you can guarantee he's going to come for it. All right, you go ahead. Let's go on to Beast versus Bench. You can keep talking about him. Beast versus Bench. Is losing fun? Is losing fun. I will. I will talk about Miranda. I realize it's a two-game series. I realize he only played in one of those games. But I do think that Jose Miranda, the reason that they won game two was because of him. So he's got to be my beast, Dan. He won Puckett's picks for me, and he won the game for the Twins. How does that not deserve the beast? It is a seemingly deserving choice, but I'm going to go with Joe Ryan's start in game two because the Twins had not had a great start. They've had very few good starts, actually, for the last week and a half, it feels like. Um, But I'm going to give it to Joe ryan for turning that around he's not going to pitch again before the all-star break so this is an important start for him who do you have on your bench i have Gio urshela because of that missed opportunity with the bases loaded in game one he was 0 for 6 in the series i don't love faulting him as much for that but we really the twins needed him to come through in in one of those late close moments that he has been so good in and so frequently up for um so i was just disappointed he didn't even get the ball you know somewhere to even get a single to make that game a little bit closer because if he's able to knock in just a run or two in that spot totally different game i went with buxton and i realized this is my third time giving buxton the bench moniker and i will argue one of those times probably shouldn't have gone to him but it was really hard to find someone else to choose and he had a rough series this is rough though dan oh for nine seven guys left on base five strikeouts that is a bad bad line rocco's rewind So I sort of mentioned this in the recap, but I do think that Winder was struggling because of the weird rain delays. And I think pulling Winder earlier might have been the better call. The hard part is you're still having to have someone cover those innings, right? So even with Winder going as far as he did in game one, going through five innings pitched, you still had McGill go an inning and two thirds and you had Moran go an inning and a third. So you still need to cover those innings. But I just think, I don't know how fair it is to Winder to keep throwing him out there after these delays. Yeah, and it was rough because the fifth inning was really what what did him in. He gave up that two-run homer to Adamas. And other than that, I mean, he pitched pretty efficiently. He didn't pitch poorly. It's just really hard to come out of a rain delay. Yeah, well, what do you have for Rocco? So Rocco loves the matchup, right? He, of course. So often, so often, you know, guys like Luis Arais, Alex Kirlov, Max Kepler aren't in there against lefties because the logic would say, well, uh, you know, they're tougher on him. But here's the thing. Aaron Ashby, the Brewers starter in the second game, lefties hit 302 against him this season. And I feel like sometimes we forget that that's not like a rule. You know, like the lefty righty thing is not always 100%. Some guys are better or worse, you know, against the, the guy on their same side. So Rocco doesn't always have to be so rigid about that lefty 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 righty matchups i think he's very concerned about a rise winning a batting title that's really what this is about Dan. well but isn't that kind of that's an interesting part of this discussion because if we're talking about batting titles 20 30 years ago when matchups weren't quite the same thing you know guys just kind of batted where they batted does that change the way we think about any of these batting averages because they're so tailored to be against just the right matchups yeah i think i'm in agreement with you especially with a rise like even if his numbers aren't as good against lefties it's still better than almost everybody else on the team like put the guy out there right and i wonder too like historically if guys just if those splits weren't as drastic i haven't gone back and back and looked at these splits for the tony Gwynns of the world right i don't know what their splits were but you I feel love like... you love the tony Gwynn <laughs> Louisa rise comparison <laughs> I, I do i do i'm i feel like i must have picked that up from somebody maybe terry francona made the line once and i, I love terry francona because he compliments twins batters all the time so <laughs> anyway um we should let's move forward here to our minnesota moment Minnesota moment. 
I'll let you go first because you took the obvious one, Dan. Well, I did. So the the walk-off home run, it's Miranda's second walk-off hit of his career, but the first home run, there's something about that. He's also been close in a couple of other games, especially, I mean, Dick Bramer. If you if you only listen to Dick Bramer, Miranda's done this like four or five times, I feel like, over <laughs> the course of the season. Um, but what a big moment for him. I'm just saying, Dan, once we sort of gave him the men for the win, you know, valid stamp of approval, He's really starting to to show himself his true colors, Dan, of being the guy who was mashing at AAA last season. Gleeman tweeted about his stats. It's almost identical, his his slash line from AAA to the majors. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good thing that he got the call up when he did, and it just makes that Donaldson trade look more and more like the right call. Um, wh- what is your moment? As sort of the, the precursor to that walk-off hit, that walk-off hit doesn't matter as much unless they get out of the top of the ninth. Duran is on the mound, there's runners in first and second, and a sharp ball is hit to Luis Arise, who's playing off first base. He throws it to second to Correa, and then Correa chucks it back to Arise at first for the double play to end the top of the ninth. And I thought this play was so good because it showed the versatility of Arise at first to not only make the throw, but also get back and cover first base, which I don't think is typically how that would play. Like normally Polanco would be there to cover first or even the pitcher, depending Mm -hmm. where Polanco was playing. So for Arise to make the throw to Correa and then Correa, I don't know how fast he threw that ball. And the thing is, it wasn't even a close play at first. Like I listened to it first on the radio broadcast and then I went back and I and I rewatched the game on the on the recap and and it wasn't as close as they made it sound on the radio. Like it was a great play, but it was like he beat him by a step. Like that's how fast Correa got that ball back to a rise. I'm really coming to appreciate Correa's defense. That guy yeah. can throw the ball hard and with accuracy. Um, it's really something to have a shortstop like that. Yeah, well, let's keep going, Dan Mauer's musings. I just don't know how it can get any better. Mauer's musings. I promised I would bring this up again, David. Miguel <laughs> Sano has been mashing now. Now it's official because he's at AAA. He had a double. He had a walk in the first game with a doubleheader. I just think, I think Miguel Sano is going to make some appearances. So my question for you is, how does it happen? Whose spot does he take? Miguel Sano, I think it's like 11 more days is all he can spend in the minors. And Rocco's been dodging the question. He's like, well, we'll just figure that out in 11 days. A lot of things can happen in baseball, i.e., hmm, who needs a little bit of a stint on the IL for a rest? Um, Who's it going to be? What's going to happen, David? First of all, folks, I do have to say this is remarkable. The speed at which Miguel has been cruising through the minors. I truly thought that he would be playing at the local gym down in Fort Myers for quite a while before we'd see him. But he makes the jump to AAA. And OK, mashing, David, <laughs> mashing. Did you see that double? It was a beauty. <laughs> opposite field (laughs) this is where i struggle a little bit because i understand if you get the best out of miguel sano there is a very good baseball player there the problem is how often are you getting the best out of sano and the thing is dan there's only so many double plays there's only so many terrible strikeouts i can watch him hit or miss and still feel like, yes, this is a guy I want on the roster. But we've watched it's so like, many it's... Correa double plays and Gio Urshela double plays. What's a little bit of Miguel in there? Okay, just so we're just so we're clear, you just compared Miguel Sano to Carlos Correa. So in just... his ability to hit into double plays. <laughs> Carlos Correa hits into so many double plays. How many times does he come up to the plate and you're like, oh, well, there goes the inning because grounded to short, first pitch. I'm sure it's a less percentage than Joe Maurer. <laughs> What are you that much Why are you bringing Joe into this? Which, by the way, we should bring Joe into this. In game two of the broadcast, the YouTube guys like missed an entire inning because they were just fawning over Joe. And I get fawning over Joe. That's great. But like the twins got two guys on base and all the YouTube guys can talk about is Joe. Oh, That's all they gosh. want to talk. It was like a podcast with you and Hoags, Dan. That's what that was. <laughs> but it was anyway, back to the you're dodging the Sano question, though. I think you're probably right. What you said last episode, yes. it'll be Kyle Garlic. Yes. But the thing is. Kyle Garlick is a right-handed bat. Sano is a right-handed bat. I guess right now, Dan, would you rather have Kyle Garlick taking on lefties, or would you rather have Miguel Sano taking on whoever he's going to hit against? I want Sano. I want to see the great comeback, David. Because here's the thing. I think Sano's ceiling is so much higher than Kyle Garlick's. Yeah, I mean, Kyle Garlick's ceiling is is already like, they already poured cement, right? Like, there's no, we know what his ceiling is. There's no higher. There's nowhere else for Kyle Garlick to go. He, if he's on and he's against a lefty, he's probably going to hit a home run. If he's batting against a righty or he's not on, he's not going to do anything. He's going to go over, almost no question. Well, and if and when Snow is on, he can carry the Twins. And I think it, that's worth carry the risk. The- 
I just feel so bad about this because I have to buy you beer now. Because now it seems impossible that he doesn't make the major somehow. However, Rocco continuing to dodge the question does give me a little hope that maybe they're going to keep him in the minors somehow. I think they're going to keep him there the max 20 games. Um, is because I think they do want to make sure that he is as right as Miguel Sano can be. But also, they, <laughs> they don't want to have to make that choice. So um, anyway, what, what's your musing? Yeah, so there's been some conversation on Twins Twitter and a couple other guys commenting on this. Who are you more concerned about right now? Are you more concerned about the Guardians or are you more concerned about the White Sox? Because the Guardians are four and a half back, but the White Sox are only five games back. Right now, Dan, heading into the All-Star break, and now we have a series to close out the first half of the season against the White Sox. Who are you more concerned about? So the Twins have actually played both of them really quite well. I know that Cleveland has has won some games against the Twins where I think the White Sox have only beat them once. I think ultimately I am more concerned about the Guardians because they've been peskier, and I also like their manager a lot more I like Terry Francona more than I like La Russa right now and so I, I would lean towards the Guardians I don't know how La Russa still has a job to be I, honest with I you. know I know especially when Toronto's manager got fired this week and they're four games better than the White Sox yeah I it's is shocking honestly and like just the way that managers are being fired I know we're going to talk about that in a second but my goodness it's a, it's a crazy year this year do you have a clear answer no, I think I would probably lean White Sox because as good as the Cleveland rotation can be and as good as some of the top level players are on that team, the White Sox definitely have a more complete puzzle. And I think the pieces are there. They just haven't figured out how to fit them all together. So like the Cleveland team, they have the edge pieces, but they're missing some of the center pieces is the problem. Honestly, if the White Sox like... <laughs> Like Lance Lynn's ERA is like seven something. Like you would think if he and some of the other starters can get it back together, I think the White Sox can be formidable. But again, they're a they're a mediocre team at best right now. Maybe I guess I probably have more confidence in them truly than I had in the Twins last season. Uh, in our, our sort of hope to keep listeners entertained for for a terrible baseball team. <laughs> All right, well let's uh, let's grade the series. <laughs> series grades i'm gonna give them a b i mean it's a two-game series you're playing against a team that's very good it's a team you haven't seen much of and the way that first game went with the weird rhythm and the rain delays i'm gonna give them a b i'm less likely to give them a pass i gave them a c because i thought that that first game was kind of listless and the second game very nearly slipped away from them. i know that they won it but i just i thought this was an average you know you split two games and so you get a c fair enough well let's keep going dan herbie's headline I don't know, Jack. It looked like Herbeck pulled him off the back. Herbie's Headlines. We had just mentioned the Blue Jays firing their manager, and this comes on the heels of an AL East division, Dan, that is, it's remarkable. It is remarkable. At this point in the season, we're at the halfway point. Every team in the AL East is above 500. And to me, the most impressive part is the Baltimore Orioles. I mean, what yeah. a turnaround that they've had for us having some terrible baseball. We saw them play good baseball against the Twins. Arguably, they, they deserve to win that series against the Twins the way that that went. I think that's pretty dang cool. I'm I'm curious to see if this is something that can be sustained next season with a more balanced schedule. Still, the most remarkable part, the Yankees have a 13 and a half game lead in that division, David. They're 61 and 26. Yeah, it's quite shocking because knowing that they're going to have to play these guys in the AL East that are not necessarily bad baseball teams. I mean, the Orioles just won 10 in a row. That's incredible. Um, by the way, speaking of winning 10 in a row, I think the Mariners are up to 9 or 10 now out here too. So there's some good baseball being played on the coast right now. Yeah, there should be one other note here that I want to mention that sort of fits into this category. I'm not really big into the All-Star game. Never really have been. The home run derby drives me nuts every year. It's like, it's kind of a cool, like sort of niche thing but i don't get really hyped for it but my goodness dan the lineup i don't know if there was some pact among good players in the mlb who were like we got to make sure that pete alonzo does not win a third home run derby because guys are coming out dan this is going to be one that i am going to be sure to tune into yeah, I'm, I'm actually really glad Byron Buxton is not doing it. Um, I just think the less wear and tear. He should go to the All-Star game. He should play his inning or two, and then he should come back healthy and still pretty rested back to Minnesota. Yeah, so for those of you curious, we have Jose Ramirez, Julio Rodriguez, Kyle Schwarber, Juan Soto, Pete Alonso, Ronald Acuna Jr., and Albert Pujols, Dan, rounding out with that legacy selection. Thank goodness. I will tune in to see Albert Pujols hit some home runs. That'd be pretty cool. All right, sir, let's uh, let's go on to Puckett's Picks for the next series. And we'll see you tomorrow night. Puckett's Picks.
Yeah, so listener Matthew provided us with the pick we have. He took Kirilov off the board, and he he fully admitted. He said it's a bit of a dark horse candidate, but that's who I'm feeling. All right, so David, I'm going to take another shot at the YouTube broadcasters here. So the play-by-play guy, apparently like his sister is in Hamilton right now, and he had to point this out to Jose Miranda in this awkward post-game interview. But here's the deal. I am so tired. Hang on, hang on. What? I don't even under. I, I truly don't understand what you just said. You don't understand. So the the announcer's sister is in Hamilton. Yes, the musical. Yes, and he. Well, he brought this up to Jose Miranda because he thinks, because poor Jose Miranda has to probably answer the, oh, you're related to Lin-Manuel Miranda? Oh, I'm going to talk to you about Hamilton now. Like, that's all the connections. And here's the thing. Everybody, even Chris Atterbury and all the Twins people have been using the darn not throw away his shot line about Jose Miranda. Do they not know that there are a lot of other great lines in Hamilton? My goodness. We don't have to keep bringing up the not throw away his shot line. So I'm going to bring up a different one, David. Wait for it. I'm going to pick... Louisa Rise here with this one. Okay, so before I give my pick, <laughs> a couple of things. Dan and I have a lot in common. There is one thing that we definitely don't have in common. Dan's love of Broadway musicals is not something that I will ever understand. Just talk. Just talk. Either have a song or talk. Don't do both. Don't do both. Nobody well, wants that. Well, you're not that. doing both. You're singing. It's, it's like going to an opera, David. That's what's so great about Hamilton. They sing the entire thing, David. You it's and so I impressive. have very... Very different definitions of great, Dan. I gotta say this. I just I won't understand. That would explain so like, the Joe Maurer disagreement. I suppose too. Yeah, in that way. Anything that you just said, talking about Hamilton, you talked with a matter of factness <laughs> that I'm not sure what percentage of our listeners would have been able to tell you who the lead of Hamilton was and that he was related to to, to Miranda. Are you saying just, you didn't know that? No, that's I. That's why I was How so lost in the initial that? comment. So you haven't why caught any I of care? those not throw away their shot references that they have all been making about jose miranda i assume that's just something that somebody said i didn't know it was like a line from something oh my gosh where have you been under a rock david my goodness go see a musical it's the greatest music of our generation come on david no the the greatest music of our generation is is hamilton (laughs) musical is what i said not music i didn't want to categorize it like that anyway (laughs) kufus We have gotten way off topic, but I just can't understand this. This is this goes all back to that. What was that movie? La La Land that I watched <laughs> twice. I watched once, hated it. Dan was like, it's the greatest movie ever. I watched it again. I watched that whole movie again for you, Dan. And I hated it even more the second time. Didn't and folks, I like, folks, hang I, on. I, I, just so you know, just so you know, I have two different voicemails from Dan Thompson on my phone of him calling, just singing songs from La La Land. Like, there was no reason to do that. He did that strictly to annoy me. And so, like, I understand, I understand your taste in movies is something, Dan. But I got to say, my goodness, now I got these Hamilton references. I just... Fans want an ejection. There it goes. And that was Gardy's gripe. Oh, damn. All right. Are you it's picking late. Korea? Is that what you're it's doing? Le- yes, of course. I. The <laughs> rules are the same. When Korea is available, I'm going to take Korea. Um, we should we should mention no we're not going to mention <laughs> anything should, else I think we, we just need to be mention? done now um, folks if you like what you hear please tell a friend you can follow us on Twitter at Min for the Win you can find our Min for the Win Facebook page you can find us on YouTube as well make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you're notified when new episodes are available and if you could leave us a rating that would be great thanks for listening and as always go Twins That'll wrap up another episode of Men for the Win, a podcast hosted by David Kufis and Dan Thompson, two avid fans who appreciate well-played baseball, especially when it's done by the Twins. Thanks so much for listening, and as always, go Twins! Go Twins!